All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on 1 Corinthians. Before we jump into the material for this recording, just wanted to remind you that if you're looking for some real practical help on how to read the Bible well and how to apply it to your life, I have a free ebook over on the website, listenerscommentary.com, that is about 35 pages and gives you five practices for reading the Bible well and understanding it well, and five practices for how to put it into practice in your life. So, totally free. And you just got to put in your name, your email address. It's over there at listenerscommentary.com. All right. In this recording, we are going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 31. And this chapter begins a whole section that goes from 12 to 14 that revolves around one particular topic. So it's an extended discussion of one issue that the Corinthians are having in their church gatherings. If you remember, the whole context of chapter 11 through 14 is specifically that, order and propriety in the worship gatherings of the church. And they're having various kinds of issues with that. And so he's talked about the issue of uh, order and propriety with regard to the head covering convention, what men should do, what women should do. By and large, the church has that one down pretty good, but there's maybe a few contentious people with that. He's talked about a really shameful thing that's going on around their communal meal and the Lord's Supper, where the people with more uh, food and money and wealth and status are eating a feast and kind of off by themselves. And those that hardly have anything, uh, they are eating by themselves and they're not getting much. And Paul is aghast by that. Now, here in chapter 12, Paul picks up this issue um, of something that the Corinthians have asked him about in the letter they sent. Notice chapter 12 begins with now concerning. This is the phrase that Paul uses when he's going to talk about something they asked him about in the letter they sent. And the specific topic here is what is traditionally called spiritual gifts. So chapter 12 through 14 all revolves around that particular issue, particular question that the Corinthians had. And even though they're traditionally called spiritual gifts, uh, the word Paul actually uses for the gifts in this section derives from the Greek word charis, which means grace. And so he's talking about gifts of grace, grace gifts, if you will. This section culminates in chapter 14 in an extended discussion of speaking in tongues and prophecy in particular. And so it becomes pretty clear that in the worship gathering, um, the gifts in general were a source of tension and confusion, but particularly what seems to have been causing a lot of the problems was how they were highlighting the gift of speaking in tongues over all the other gifts, and some were basically claiming that if you had that gift and you could do that, then you were more spiritual than others. That seems to be really the focal point of the issue when we get to chapter 14. The great heart of this section in 12 through 14 is chapter 13, which is the well-known love chapter in the Bible. And Paul basically says there that love is greater than spiritual gifts. So in all their zeal for spiritual gifts, what they really need to do is pursue love. And so love must be the context in which spiritual gifts are understood and are used in the church. And that whole discussion of spiritual gifts and how they're used and trying to set it in the context of love and all of that, that whole discussion begins here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 by emphasizing the oneness of the body of Christ and the diversity of the body of Christ. That's really at the heart of chapter 12. So, just as Paul has done with some of the other issues he's addressed in the letter, he works up to very specific instructions, and he does so by means of sort of general guidelines, general principles that speak to and inform what he's going to say by way of specific instructions. So chapter 12, general guidelines, chapter 13, general guidelines, chapter 14, specific issues, specific instructions. That's the way this whole little section works. As Paul addresses the question they had asked him about spiritual things, spiritual people, spiritual gifts. So look at chapter 12. He says, now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant of this matter that you have asked me about. I've got some things I want to say about that. Uh, Notice, however, that when it says spiritual gifts, that literally is just the word for spiritual things. 
And so it could refer to spiritual matter, spiritual things, maybe gifts, or it could refer to spiritual people. It's actually the same word that's translated as spiritual people in chapter 3. Um, and it's translated both spiritual people and spiritual things in chapter 2, depending on how you translate that. We suggested there that should, at least one of those cases, it should be spiritual people in view of the connection with chapter 3, where it's completely clear that it's spiritual people. Here in 12.1, it's a little unclear. And so you get this translation here, spiritual gifts. Um, and it could be spiritual gifts or spiritual things, but it could also be spiritual people. And the reason for that is because what's very clear as you read through 1 Corinthians is that part of the problem in Corinth is that there are people who are claiming a higher degree of spirituality based on their knowledge gifts, based on their speaking gifts. And that's causing a lot of divisions in the church. And certainly, that's a huge part of the problem with regard to these grace gifts that Paul is discussing in chapter 12 through 14. In fact, in 1437, at the end of the discussion of this whole topic, as Paul wraps it up, he actually uses the same word here that's in, here in 12.1, but there it's clearly talking about people, spiritual people. But in the beginning of chapter 14, 14.1, in the middle of chapter 14, 14.12, that, that word is used again, and there it's clearly referring to spiritual things. So in chapter 14, Paul uses this word spiritual to refer to both spiritual people and to spiritual things or spiritual gifts. And that means it's just not totally clear which sense Paul is using it here in 12.1. Does he mean, as the New American Standard translates it, spiritual gifts? Does he mean spiritual people? Could be either, because the issue is... Uh, there are spiritual gifts or spiritual expressions, and then there are people who are claiming, because they have those gifts, that they're more spiritual than others. So either way works in 12.1, as long as we understand that it's not just gifts, it's also people uh, that are involved. That these grace gifts are being employed by people in the church in a way that they think elevates their status and their claim to spirituality. That is, there are people who claim to be more spiritual because of the grace gifts they have, and they're using them in those sort of self-serving, divisive sorts of ways. So, concerning spiritual matters, spiritual people, spiritual things, then, I don't want you to be unaware. And then Paul begins his discussion of the topic by recalling their conversion. So, verse 2 says, You know that when you were pagans... You were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. The word pagans literally is Gentiles, but in this context, it refers to their pagan past, when they were living like Gentiles, when they were living like pagans. And it describes idols in classic Jewish fashion as nothings, as mute things, right? You were led astray to mute idols, idols that couldn't talk. And the reason he chooses the word mute here is because he's going to be talking in this section specifically about and highlighting Gifts of speaking, particularly prophecy and tongues when we get to chapter 14. So, in your past, when you were pagans, you worshipped mute idols, right? Then in verses, beginning here in verse 2 and all the way down to verse 6, it goes together as one big block that describes their conversion from pagan idolatry to Christ. And what he points out in verse 3 is that it's only by the Spirit that any of them and all of them are able to confess the Lord. So they've all experienced the Spirit. They all have the Spirit. That's what enables them to confess Jesus as Lord. And not only that, their whole conver conversion to Christ ushered them into the, the experience of the, the work of the one true God, the triune God, the God who's three in one, and that work entails diversity and unity. Just as God is three in one, so his work in and among them is both unified and diverse. And so their conversion is all the work of God, and it entails the very thing that he's going to highlight in this chapter, unity and diversity. So um, they once were pagans, they worshiped mute idols, but, verse 3, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is the basic Christian confession, which marks conversion, 
see, for example, Romans chapter 10, right? To say Jesus is Lord is a mark of you've moved from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. And it marks continued faithfulness to Jesus. And that confession, Jesus is Lord, is is prompted by and made possible by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so someone who says Jesus is Lord has experienced the presence and the power and the work of God's Spirit in that person's life. And so what verse 3 seems to do in the context of the discussion here is it, it provides the lowest common denominator of the Spirit's work in a person's life. And so in the matter of spiritual things and spiritual people, guess what? Any and all of you in the church at Corinth who have said Jesus is Lord have done so by the presence and power of the Spirit. Spiritual people confess Jesus is Lord because of the Holy Spirit. And this conversion and this confession involves one, uh, involves a person in the experience of the work of the triune God. So he says in verses four through six, now there are a variety of gifts but the same Spirit. And there are a varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all people. Notice the emphasis on God as three in one. Um, Spirit, Lord, God, right? We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Lord Jesus. We're talking about God the Father, the triune God. And so there's an emphasis on uh, the triune God here. And that emphasis entails a lot of variety. There are a variety of gifts. There are a variety of ministries. There are a variety of effects, or that word effects means operations or workings, right? But there's also an emphasis on oneness. It's the same spirit. It's the same Lord. It's the same God. And so the the Spirit, the Lord, and God the Father, they supervise and allocate all these gifts, ministries, and workings as they design and as they desire. And so what you get is oneness and diversity at the same time. And Paul's going to develop this theme in what follows, namely that with God and the Spirit, they're, they're the ones who set things up with all the variety and all the diversity in the church, and yet with all the oneness that they themselves have. And since it's all an expression of his work in and among them, there ought not to be any pride. There not to, ought to be a superiority complex or an inferiority complex, right? It all derives from God. He's the one who has provided all of this. And so all of this variety of work, it's from God. And it's not for you. Any individual person's status or individual person's benefit, but look at verse 7. But to each one, so all this variety of gifts and ministries and workings, all of that variety to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And so the works of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the expressions of the Spirit that are going on in the church at Corinth, it's not for... um, It's not for your own personal benefit. Each individual, each one, is given whatever manifestation the Spirit gives them and works through them for the common good. That is, for the benefit of the whole church. So the Spirit distributes special abilities to individuals, not for individuals' gain or benefit or looking good or status, but for the good and the benefit of everybody in the church. That is going to be the major point and major principle right from this point here in 12.7, all the way down through chapter 14. Then, after he says that, what Paul does in verses 8 and following is he gives some examples of the manifestations of the Spirit for the common good uh, that were really uh, a big deal in the church at Corinth, that were causing some of the problems and that are working their way out in the church at Corinth. So he says in verse 8, For to one, to one particular person, is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. So, different manifestation, same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Everybody has the same in the one Spirit. Uh, To another, the effecting of miracles. To another, 
prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. And so the point of verses 8 through 11 is that there's varieties of ways in which the Spirit has gifted the people in the church in order to build the church up. But, and this is what Paul emphasizes here, but it's the one Spirit, the one and the same Spirit, who works all these things in the various individuals for the good of the whole body. Uh, so notice the emphasis on the Spirit. We pointed it out as we went. One Spirit, same Spirit, one Spirit, same Spirit. So there are various kinds of all these works, but it's the one and the same Spirit who does them all. And in verse 11, uh, Paul just puts the emphasis very clearly there. One and the same Spirit works all these things. And not only that, he's the one who distributes them. The Spirit himself chooses how he's going to allocate and distribute these gifts to each one individually. So don't get all high and mighty because you think your gift is better than somebody else's. Don't get all bummed out and think you're not worth much because your gift is different than somebody else. Each individual is, is experiencing the work of the Spirit in a unique way, not for their own benefit, but for the good of the whole. Then what Paul's going to do and in, in what follows is he's going to go on and he's going to use the analogy of a human body. How the human body has lots of different parts, but together they make up one body that's animated by one spirit. And so Paul says in verse 12, For just as the body is one, yet has many parts. Now we're talking about the human body. So just as the human body is one and has many parts, right? You got one body, but it's not all one item. You got hands, you got feet, you got noses and toes and everything else, right? Just as the human body is one and yet has many parts and all the parts of the body, though they are many, make up one body, so it is with Christ. So he's gonna use this analogy of the human body beginning here in verse 12, all the way really down until he turns to make the point from the analogy in verse 27. And obviously you can see the theme already. Diversity plus unity. There are many parts. There are different parts. They're not the same. And yet they still make up one body. That's going to be the theme of this analogy. Many different parts, one body. Now, before he develops this analogy fully, he wants to emphasize that they, as a church, are one body too. So verse 13, he says, For by one Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit that has worked in them, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one Spirit. So regardless of our background, Jews or Greeks, regardless of our class and status, slave or free, wherever we came from across the spectrum of humanity, we were all united into one body. We were baptized into one body in and through one spirit and made to drink of one spirit. In the New Testament church, when you read through the book of Acts, when you read through the letters of the New Testament, it's uh, clear that baptism was the regular way someone entered into the body of believers. When they came to faith in Jesus, they were baptized usually right away, usually on the same day. In fact, when you read the book of Acts, you see that all the time. They come to faith in Jesus and become a believer, and there's not a delay from the time they become a believer to the time they're baptized. Usually it happens on the same day, even sometimes in the middle of the night, on the same night as in the case of Acts 16 and the Philippian jailer. Well, because of that, Paul in his writings regularly just assumes that everyone's been baptized in the church because that's the way it worked. That's what they did. And that's what's going on here. His specific emphasis here is that they were all baptized into, notice, one body. Not multiple bodies, one body. And, and they all were made to partake of one spirit. And that's the emphasis. So now that he's set the stage, he's ready to develop this analogy of the human body as it applies to the body of Christ, i.e. the church. So we're one body of Christ. There's one human body. Now Paul develops that analogy to emphasize unity 
in diversity. Look at verse 14. He says, for the body is not one part, but many. It's very diverse. There's different kinds of parts. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. Uh, different doesn't mean unnecessary and unimportant. That's really important. That's the point he's drawing out here with the foot and the hand and the ear and the eye and all of that. There are different parts of the body, but it's still one body and they're still an important and necessary part of the body. Um, and so different does not mean unnecessary and unimportant. Paul continues in verse 17 and he says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? In other words, if there was no diversity, then the human body would be severely limited. Can you imagine a body that was just one giant eye? If the whole body were an eye, that's it. One giant eye, that's all you have. There's no sound, no hearing, right? Uh, there's no smelling, there's no tasting, there, there's no walking. Maybe there could be rolling because the eye is a ball, who knows? But right, if it's just one part, it's not going to work. If there's no diversity, the human body would be incredibly and severely limited. It wouldn't be able to do everything it can do with the diversity. But, verse 18, but now God has arranged the parts, each one of them in the body. Again, we're talking about the human body, but we're, with, we're talking about the human body with a look at the church body. So now God has arranged the parts, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. This is God's intent. The way the body is designed with feet and hands and eyes and ears and uh, noses to smell and mouths to taste and all the parts of the body, this is God's design. He has arranged it. Now, he has appointed it. In fact, the word arranged there is, is the same word that will be translated appointed down in verse 28 when he applies this to the church body. Um, just as it's true in the human body that God has arranged it, so it's true in the church body that God has arranged it. And this word arranged means to put or to place. Like God is the one who has set this up just as he desired. Verse 19, if they were all one part, where would the body be? There wouldn't be a body. Like, can you imagine just one giant foot? That's it. No body, just a foot. Uh, but now there are many parts, but one body. Diversity, many parts. Unity, one body that all works together, animated by one spirit. Because of this, all the parts of the body are necessary. And so he continues in verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. So it's not just an inferiority complex where, you know, the ear or the eye or somebody feels bad because they're not the other one. It's also a superiority complex where the eye can't uh, say to whatever part it wants to, I don't need you. Or the, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. The feet are needed. The head is needed. The eye is needed. The hands are needed. Everything is, is needed. That kind of bickering between... Uh, the parts of your human body makes no sense, right? Like that kind of infighting in the context of the human body, foolish. It's silly. Paul's painting a silly picture here to help us realize how silly this kind of bickering and infighting is. And the principle is the same for the body of Christ. That's where Paul's going to go with this when he applies it to the body of Christ very shortly. Verse 22 continues and says, on the contrary, it's not, you can't, like, right, the, the I can't say I have no need of you, head to the feet, no need of you. On the contrary, in contrast to that kind of bickering and infighting and saying I don't need you, right, it's actually much truer that the parts of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those parts of the body which we consider less honorable, on these parts we actually bestow greater honor. And our less presentable parts become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable parts have no need of it. And Paul is really just drawing out this idea. is like, it, it doesn't matter if you're a more noticeable part or a less notable, noticeable part, or you seem like a more important part and you seem like maybe not quite as important part. It doesn't matter. All the parts are necessary to make one body. 
And Paul doesn't specify what parts he has in mind by the weaker parts or the less honorable parts or the less presentable parts. He doesn't specify what parts he has in mind by these categories. So it's really not worth our time trying to speculate. And sometimes I read that in commentaries where they're trying to guess which parts he has in mind. It doesn't really matter. What you want to do is get the point. And the point is uh, that what Paul is saying is if you stop and think about it, some of the parts of the human body that we give less attention to or maybe think about less often are actually incredibly necessary and terribly important. In fact, we all know this, that some of those parts we just take for granted and don't really think about, all of a sudden they become very important to us when they're injured or they hurt or we can't use them, correct? In fact, in the city of Corinth, the uh, the god Asclepius had a huge campus and temple facility there, and Asclepius was the god of healing, the god of the doctors. In fact, at Asclepius's complex in Corinth, there were uh, pools and uh, rooms, and there were medical people, and in fact, there were little statues of various parts of the body, arms and legs and even uh, hands and other parts of the body that could be affected by various ailments that uh, archaeologists have dug up around Asclepius's complex in and around Corinth. Um, and Paul is playing off of this experience of theirs, right? They know about the body. They know all the different parts. Uh, and it would be silly for the, to think of them as good enough by themselves. And we know how it works that there are parts of the body that we give less attention to and think about less often, but those parts are actually incredibly necessary and important. And we, we discover that when all of a sudden they hurt or there's some sort of ailment. And so Paul says, God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that part which lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same care for one another, that all the parts of the body work together for the good of the whole body, that they all care for the whole body, and um, even sometimes those parts which don't seem that important actually have really incredible importance when you actually stop and think about it. And so there's one body with all these different parts and all those parts care for all the different parts. And when one part is affected, right, it affects the whole thing. And so they all care for one another. In fact, verse 26 goes on and says, look, if one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. Again, Asclepius' temple there in Corinth, right? So you come and it's, it's that little statue of the arm that you point out and say, that's where my problem is. It's with the arm. Or maybe it's the foot or maybe it's the ankle or maybe it's the thumb. The thumb is what's hurting you, right? It doesn't matter how big or how small. When one part of the body hurts and suffers, the whole body is affected by it. And when one part of the body is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. And so everything Paul has said up to this point here in verse 26 has been primarily about the human eye, but it's been worded in such a way that it's glancing towards the church body. So now, beginning in verse 27, Paul draws out the implications and makes the point. Look at verse 27. Now, you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. So, you, O Corinthian church, you, O local church body, you are Christ's body. And each person there that's in that church in Corinth, you're individually parts of that body. You're like little uh, members of that body, parts of that body. And you make one body in Christ animated by the one spirit. And just as God has arranged for the human body to have different parts and different roles, and yet uh, all be one body? Well, the same is true with the body of Christ. So, verse 28, and God has appointed, there's that word appointed that was translated arranged about the human body up and above. So, God has arranged it. God has set it in place. That's the idea of this word appointed. It's to put or to set. God has set it up and put it in place in the church, these different parts. And he's going to list off some. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. And so God has arranged the body with all these different parts. People who have different uh, roles to play, 
and different gifts to offer. Uh, so there's people like Paul, who's an apostle, who has been commissioned specifically by Jesus to, to go and start these churches, right? There are prophets in the church. Uh, and we, we know from chapter 11, there's male prophets and there's female prophets. There's teachers in the church who their job is to, to, to exhort and encourage and help people understand who Jesus is and all of that. There are people who have the, the ability to work miracles and gifts of healings. Um, and there are people who have the ability to organize and administrate and work things out. And, and then there are various kinds of tongues, languages, and he'll talk about that. And the reason he brings that up is because this is really at the heart of the problem in Corinth. And he'll deal with all of that in chapter 14. And God is the one who has set all this up so that the body of Christ is composed of people whom God has given specific abilities and specific roles to play. And not everyone has the same role or the same gift. Look at verse 29. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret or translate, do they? No, they don't. The implied answer to all those questions is no. There's some that are apostles. There's some that are prophets. There's some that uh, have gifts of healing. There's some that speak in tongues. There's some that can translate those different languages when people speak, right? That There are all these different people, and just like the body has feet and hands and ears and eyes and heads and all of these different parts that make one body, so it is true in the body of Christ. There's different people with different roles and different abilities, but it makes one body. And then Paul wraps up chapter 12 with a statement, really two statements, that's sort of a transition out of what he's just said and into chapter 13 and really sets up what he's going to say in chapter 13. And yet it is a verse, verse 31, that has actually in some ways vexed a lot of interpreters. It says this, but earnestly desire uh, the greater gifts, and yet I'm going to show you a far better way. And the reason this has cause some confusion for interpreters and, and commentators on the scripture is the question is how do these verses, these two sentences here in verse 31 relate to one another? And not only that, why would Paul command them to desire the greater gifts, meaning the spiritual gifts, since that's the very problem he's correcting? But there's actually a very simple solution that is noted, noted by many interpreters, and that's this. Grammatically, the verb in the first sentence, desire, can also be translated as a statement and not a command. In Greek, it could be either one, grammatically. And if you take it as a statement, not as a command, then what Paul says is, you earnestly desire the greater gifts. In other words, that's what you Corinthians are doing. Um, you're, you're earnestly desiring these, quote unquote, greater gifts that you think are so impressive and so important, the more showy ones like prophecy and tongues and all of that. You earnestly desire that. Then the second sentence is Paul's statement of his purpose and what he's trying to do. And it, and it says this, and yet I show you a far better way. So here you Corinthians are all clamoring for what you think are the greater gifts. And yet I'm showing you a far better way. And that far better way is uh, unity and diversity that he's just finished talking about and the way of love that he's going to talk about in chapter 13. And so there's a far better way than all this infighting and bickering and clamoring over the gifts. That far better way is unity and diversity that's carried out with Christ-like love. That's what verse 31 is getting at as Paul wraps up this section. And that really highlights the main lesson for all of us out of chapter 12. And that main lesson is that in the body of Christ, there are different gifts and all those gifts are necessary, important for the body to be who God designed it to be and called it to be. And God is the one who set it up that way. So rather than clamor after the showy gifts, rather than put people down because they don't have those gifts or whatever else it is, let's all work together as one body for the mission and for the honor of Jesus. And let's do so, as Paul's about to say, in the spirit of Christ-like love, because it's by the one and the same Holy Spirit that we are formed into one body in Christ.
All right, thanks for checking out this recording on the Listener's Commentary. The Listener's Commentary is made possible by the generous support of people just like you. So thanks a ton for your generosity and support if you're one of the supporters. And if you want to join the team of supporters, you can do so by going to listenerscommentary.com, clicking the Give button, putting in an amount. You can give a one-time gift there, or you can click the little box that says Make This a Monthly Donation. You can also support this ministry through the Study Hub, where you can give whatever you can afford there, get access to bonus material, maps, charts, uh, additional studies. I'm constantly adding more material to that. Uh, as I, I realize, oh man, this would be helpful to people. And that's another great way to support this ministry. So thanks a ton for your support.